Hey, how's it going, everyone? It looks like we're live. I see comments over in the comments section. We are at uh, Mark Middleberg's um, house. We jumped on his Wi-Fi, so we don't know um, how well it's going to go. Looks like it's a pretty steady stream, but if we go out for any reason, uh, we'll jump right back on. Um, we've got several apologists here, and... Uh, we're going to be uh, having them ask, uh, uh, answer some questions um, in their fields of expertise. You guys didn't need to all be down here at once, but uh, I was going to kind of cycle you down. But it, since you're already so here, you're, since, no, 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 since you're already here, we'll go ahead and jump on. 165 um, people watching already. So we've this got, uh, well, might as well come back here. Look, we've got Paul Copan here. If you don't know Paul Copan, <laughs> what do you do, Paul? Here, step up. I'm a professor of philosophy and ethics at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And if you guys, uh, if you saw my debate with Shabir Ali on uh, whether um, uh, whether the Quran is a book of peace and whether the Bible is a book of peace, uh, I used a lot of Paul's uh, material in the debate on whether the Bible is a book of peace because um, he deals a lot with uh, Old Testament violence. And the main book there would be um, Is God a Moral Monster? And also... Um, Did God really command genocide? Yeah, with uh, with Matt Flanagan. Now, um, for for those of you for whom that is a kind of big issue, uh, if you read passages in the Old Testament, you'll see passages uh, calling for people to be completely wiped out, men, women, and children. And so, uh, both atheists and Muslims will cite these passages, um, arguing that uh, the Old Testament. Um, advocates genocide, at least in, in certain instances. And you've argued in your books that that might not necessarily be the case because there are some problems within the Bible, within, with, as far as within the Bible, for coming to that conclusion. So uh, if you want to step forward and uh, give people an idea of some of the difficulties with, with that claim, that, that it's actually calling for gen genocide. Because to be clear, if you just read some of these passages, that's exactly what it looks like, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you would you would look at that, and I would I would simply say that well, one, the there is a hyperbolic dimension to it that there is exaggeration in these texts that you will have language where they've been utterly destroyed, but then a chapter, even a few verses later, they are still there. Um, you know, Saul utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but then David is fighting an army of the Amalekites in the same vast terrain, 120 miles or so. Uh, you know, he's fighting them again in the same, you know, in the same book. Uh, so, so what else is going on here? Well, John Walton has actually proposed something that I think makes sense of the fact that there is this language of utter destruction and also lots of survivors. And he argues, well, one, that, of course, there was the language of hyperbole and exaggeration. So it's like, kind of like ancient Near Eastern trash talking. Like when we say, uh, we totally slaughtered their basketball team. Uh, we totally annihilated those guys. There's ancient Near Eastern trash talk, and people understood that there would be a lot of people left standing after a battle, even though you did that to them. Um, but John Walton offers this argument that um, that when it talks about you know utter destruction, he, he argues that it's it has more the sense of identity removal. That uh, that what is being done here is that identity is being removed. So so you know uh, one king Agag, you know he was the king of the Amalekites, and because Saul didn't kill him, kind of the identity marker for the Amalekites, his kingship was removed. Uh, it was like idolatry and divination and so forth. Uh, you have a, a greater focus on destroying the paraphernalia, the, the, the shrines and the Asherah poles and the, uh, and the idols and so forth. And then, you know, in Deuteronomy 7, it says, you know, after you've destroyed them and you, you know, it says, go on and destroy their, their, their religious paraphernalia and don't make any you know, covenants with them. Don't intermarry with them. Well, what's going on here? If you take this literally, then it's they're going to cancel. They're just going to be contradictory. But if you understand that this is you, you focus on the identity removal. Remove those things that are going that, that identify them as idolaters, uh, sexual, immora, sexually immoral. Remove those things, kind of like in Nazi Germany. You know, you remove the, the, the flags, you remove the institutions, you remove the generals and the, the commanders and so forth, even though lots of Germans are left standing. That's the kind of picture of identity removal. Uh, and that would make sense in Deuteronomy 7 of, you know, don't intermarry with them, uh, don't, uh, don't, you know, don't uh, have treaties with them and so forth. So there's a lot more going mm -hmm. on here in these sorts of texts. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to unpack that. But also I think that there is a, yeah, anyway, I don't know if I wanted to follow up on that. Oh, but, yeah, uh, I, just, I just wanted to point it out when... 
when I first heard this position, I thought it was like, uh, you're trying to water it down because you don't like what it teaches. Um, you don't, you don't like the fact that it's actually calling for the complete annihilation, uh, of these groups. But, uh, as I went through, uh, both, both, both of those books, um, it seems that it almost seems to require something like this because, uh, as you pointed out, you've got, uh, all the groups that are said to be genocided, if we can, can make up that word, uh, the groups that are said to be genocided, all of them, as you pointed out, uh, are around in massive numbers later on in the text, which is impossible if they've actually been wiped out. Um, and so that's the, the, the Canaanites, the Amalekites and so on. Um, but, but also that, uh, that you can read in the, in the, in the same books where it's calling for complete annihilation. Sounds like in one passage, it uses those as interchangeable with commands to drive them out of the exactly. land, yeah. which those are two completely different things. It's yeah. a completely different thing to drive someone out of the land as to completely wipe out every man, woman, and child. And so if they're using these things interchangeably, that should be a key that there's something else going on here that, that we don't necessarily, uh, that we don't get. Yeah, and I think it's also important to keep in mind that these the Canaanites are not the kinds of people you want for your next door neighbors either. I mean, they're engaged in all sorts of things that would be considered uh, criminal activities in any civilized society, you know, ritual prostitution, uh, bestiality, uh, incest, uh, you know, child sacrifice. Uh, those are the sorts of things that are bringing the wrath of God upon them through the Israelite uh, nation uh, to drive them out uh, because God doesn't want the mission of Israel and the salvation of the world compromised. So we need to think in terms of the backdrop as to who the people are and also the long range mission that God has in mind that yes, there's is a temporary judgment, but to keep Israel from being contaminated by them and thus compromising the mission that God has for the end of the to reach the ends of the earth through the Messiah to bring salvation to them. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to address a comment right here because someone doesn't seem to understand uh, the point. So, isn't the Bible to be understood literally? Oh my goodness! Yeah. No, no ju ju just to, just a review real quick, and then then yeah, you can yeah. go on. Hit it, man. Yeah. Sometimes, some t if if you just read some of these commands, right? Absolutely, completely sounds like complete annihilation. But there's a problem, right? If you continue reading in the text and it says, and you will drive them out of the land, or God will drive them out before you, you should immediately start thinking, oh, if the Bible's using these as interchangeable, I don't use those interchangeably, so I need to understand what the text is saying. For instance, if there were a culture that came along a thousand years from now, and they read, uh, they read about us, as you pointed out, saying, hey, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers, just slaughtered the Carolina Panthers. You say, oh my goodness, this is horrible. How could they slaughter another team just for playing a game? It's, it's absurd. It's ridiculous, right? And then you, of course, would, would find out if you looked into our culture how we use phrases like that, right? That, that, that you slaughter them, that you wipe them out, that you massacre these other guys. Um, and you'd find out, oh, they aren't using these terms, these, these phrases literally because that team is still around the next week, right? The same players are still around the next week. Therefore, they can't be using that, that, that language of slaughtering and massacring literally. Well, if God says, Come, you know, wipe this group out, and then it says they did it, and they did it successfully, and then the group is around later, you should immediately be thinking, maybe they're using language in a way that we don't. And that would be kind of, it, again, it seems like that would, something like that would be required for some of these passages. Right. And I would ask the question, why do we take the passages of utter destruction, if that's how it's to be interpreted, literally, but then we don't treat the survivors as literal language? Yeah, you see, if you treat them both literally, they'll cancel each other out. But if you understand that this is part of a war text genre where you have this kind of exaggeration, then you say, oh, there's no contradiction at all. There you have language of utter destruction, or we totally you know, wipe them out, and lots of survivors. We, I, I think it's helpful to make a distinction between reading the Bible literally and reading the Bible literarily. The Bible has a number of different types of literature or genres within it. Uh, there's poetry, for example. In Isaiah 55, it says the trees of the field will clap their hands. We don't take that literally. Uh, when Jesus says, I am the door, we don't take that literally. 
but we do take it literarily. We understand that these are metaphors, that these are symbols, and, and that is exactly how to treat it. Uh, and so uh, we treat each genre or type of literature according to the way that the author intended for it to be taken. Uh, and so there is no problem then to say, I don't take everything in the Bible literally, but I, should, but I do and should take everything in the Bible literarily. Sometimes I'll take it literally, other times I won't, depending upon the type of literature or genre that is contained therein. Now, uh, along this point, um, other ancient cultures of the time, mm -hmm. of, of the period, didn't other <clears throat> cultures use the same sort of language? That exactly. they, they would win a battle and talk about it as complete annihilation, even though it was just you beat, it, you beat the army? Exactly. Uh, you would have, uh, you know, Egypt and Moab and Assyria and, and, and other nations talking about how we turned them to ash, that, there was, that they were like nothing, uh, that they had disappeared and, after a battle. Uh, again, high exaggeration. Every wonder, you know, sometimes there would be these, you, you might have a narrow margin of victory, but use the language of utter destruction. We left, you know, there, there are none remaining. Um, that's the book of Joshua, too. It uses that kind of language. And we just need to understand that that is a, a genre uh, of war text uh, it, you know, in the ancient Near East. That's just how it, it's to be understood. And scholars do take it a, a, as being that uh, without any sort of compromise to the integrity of Scripture. If you understand that this is the type of literature, then you, it actually helps you to make sense uh, that it fits into the, the, the ancient Near Eastern context. And it makes sense of all of those survivors that are hanging around. So um, if you just read the text and you didn't understand that there's a, that they're using language in a way that we don't, well, we, again, we do it slightly, we do it somewhat, but, but not to that same extent. Um, it would just be a kind of mystery. And I remember when I was first reading these passages and it would say, uh, you know, completely wiped this group out and then they went out and did it. And then, hey, wait a minute, what is this group doing later on? And then the, the, I would read the notes like in a study Bible and say, well, maybe some of them survived or something like that. But they're appearing in massive, massive numbers, not just a couple of, a couple of random survivors. So it presents a kind of mystery in the text, but that if, if we understand based on um, how other ancient cultures talked, then we can kind of solve that mystery. Absolutely. And, yeah. and so this would be one way of solving the mystery. If someone else comes up with a better solution, then, you know, that would, that would, be, that would be good too, right? Yeah, yeah that'd be great. But uh, there's a growing consensus that this is how to read those texts. Um, let me say this too. Some people say, well, what about the resurrection of Jesus? What if that's just hyperbole? What if that's just exaggeration? What if we shouldn't take that literally? Well, we again look at the genre. Look at the, its its ancient biography uh, that takes history seriously, and uh, we see a consistent testimony too of Jesus' bodily resurrection, the physicality of that resurrection, the empty tomb, and so forth. All of these things reinforce the bodily resurrection of Jesus without anything to contradict it or to make it suggest that oh, it could be figurative, it could be hyperbolic or something. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, we will. If you are hovering around in the area, right. we'll uh, see what other questions pop up. All right. Very uh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Wait, wait, wait. What about if you have a YouTube channel? I saw some comments. Oh, yeah. What, what, uh, well, just people get in contact I mean, with your materials. Well, I mean, just do a search on YouTube. You can find stuff there. You can look at my, uh, you know, of course, my uh, website, paulcopan.com. And, uh, yeah. The right. book. And my books, uh, yeah, which are listed there. All right. And again, that, that is, this is uh, one of the big issues for both uh, atheists and Muslims. Um, <laughs> Uh, how can we believe certain things in the Old Testament? And so, uh, well, fortunately, we have people who've, who've dealt with these issues, who've explored the issue, and, uh, and have written books on it. So, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Here's one I'm going to take. All right. We've got Fazor. Explain how, if Jesus died on the cross, and Jesus and God are one, then how did God not die? Now, you guys understand uh, why this would be such an important issue? Um, if Jesus is God... How can God die? And this comes up over and over again. It's one of the most common questions we get from Muslims, and we can understand why Muslims would say this, because if God is eternal and immortal and isn't the sort of thing that can die, and yet we believe Jesus is God, then how could we believe Jesus died? Doesn't make any sense, right? Well, we need to take a closer look. Right? Because we have this thing called the Incarnation. Now, I've found from experience that you can spend all day explaining John 1 to your Muslim friends. For some reason, they won't get it unless you kind of give them an example. And so the example that I would share would be the Quran to help them understand the idea. 
Uh, according to Islamic theology, the Quran is Allah's eternal word, Allah's eternal speech. It's uncreated, it's incorruptible. So that's what the Quran is, right? So now, does, anyone, does everyone remember uh, several years ago when you had that guy in Florida who was going to have a burn the Quran day, and then people are killed because this guy's going to have a burn the Quran day? Uh, quick question, how could he burn Allah's eternal, uncreated, incorruptible speech? How's that possible? How can you burn something that's uncreated, eternal, and incorruptible? It wouldn't burn, right? Well, the answer, the correct answer, according to Islamic theology, is that the Quran has two natures, right? It is the eternal, incorruptible speech of Allah, but it enters our world as a physical Quran or written on the physical hearts of believers. So the Quran, as we have it in this world, has two natures. It's the uncreated eternal speech of Allah, but it is in a physical form, a physical book made of paper and glue and ink. And because it has a dual nature in our world, because it has that physical nature, it can be burned. But no one would say that because you've burned the Quran, you have thereby destroyed the eternal nature of the Quran. No Muslim would say that. They say, yes, you burned the Quran, but you haven't destroyed the eternal Quran. So that is Islamic theology. Now, my Muslim friends, once you understand your theology, that the eternal word of Allah, which has no beginning, cannot be destroyed, nevertheless enters our world in a physical form that is made of paper and glue and ink, it has a beginning in its physical form, it can be destroyed, it will eventually fall apart, and yet you wouldn't say that the eternal nature of the Quran was destroyed. If that's Islamic theology, how in the name of common sense can you say that when we read the Gospel of John and we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. How can you say that Christian belief, that Jesus, the eternal Son, entering creation, taking on a physical nature, in which case he had a dual nature, his eternal nature and the physical nature, and can therefore be killed, therefore has a physical beginning to his human nature, how can you say that that's inconsistent and ridiculous and illogical? How can you say these kinds of things? If you do, you've just undermined and destroyed your own theology. So be careful what kind of uh, objections you use. All right, guys, you guys uh, want to say hi to everyone? What are you doing over here filming me? <laughs> what do you mean you're being filmed? What's up, everybody? How's it going, guys? Who's all on here? Uh, what's up, Renee? Want to scroll through here? Yeah, let's see. Questions again. Um, all right. Oh, well, I was babbling, and then, uh, like, a million people posted comments. All right. I guess we'll just try <laughs> yeah, <guess>. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is way too many to go through. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's find some. Uh, why don't you guys tell everyone yeah. what we've been doing here for the uh, past few days? Yeah, so we've been out in um, Colorado. I live here, actually, but they're in, and we're at the um, EPS Evangelical Philosophical Society, right? Yeah. That sounds right? Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so there's a lot of speakers in town here, too, so it's really cool because we all get to get together like once a year, and this year it's in Colorado. So is this your first time in Colorado? Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Well, no, I did some rap concerts here back in the day with a bunch of cholos and lowriders. All right, guys. Could the Son and the Holy Spirit be inferior to God the Father? I'm questioning the members of the Trinity being equal. Jesus says he can do nothing without God the Father in John. So you got two, two, separate, uh, two separate kind of issues there uh, related. Could the Son and the Holy Spirit be inferior to God the Father? Is your problem with that? Uh, no, they could not and are not. Yes. Certainly the Son and the Holy Spirit aren't the Father, so they have different roles and they do different activities as far as who they are uh, and and uh, you can see this in scripture you know they work in concert they work in harmony they work in unison and once you have the Holy Spirit being referred to as God multiple places once you have that well we understand who God is when in relationship to that so you have a, a, an automatic sort of pouring in of the co-eternal co-equal aspect of who God is yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the early church fathers had to deal with this issue. Um, you've got the Father called God, uh, the Son called God, the Holy Spirit called God, and yet the Father sends the Father sends the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? 
So we look at that. Oh, wait, wait a minute. If the Father sends the, the Son and the Holy Spirit, if the Father sends the Son and the Holy Spirit, well, certainly they must be in some sense in, inferior, right? Uh, that's the claim. And there's a problem with the claim. Well, if Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God, how, in what sense can they be uh, inferior? Well, they can't be inferior in nature. If they all share the nature of Yahweh, it makes no sense to say this Yahweh is inferior to that Yahweh when there's only one Yahweh. Uh, what you can say is that uh, one is, you know, the son is sent into the world. Uh, that is a distinction. But notice that's not a distinction in attributes, right? If I say the son is sent, that is not being sent or sending. That, those are not attributes of God, right? The attributes of God are the same. Being sent and sending, those are relationships. Those are relations among persons. And that's why we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. You have multiple persons within the one nature of God. And so if you mean inferior in nature, no, uh, Son and Holy Spirit cannot be inferior in nature. As for Jesus saying he can do nothing without God, the Father, and John, you really, 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 really need to actually read that passage and not watch what Zachar Naik says about it, right? Because you can look at it in, in, in the passage, and if you just ignore everything that Jesus says there, you find, oh, he says of his own self, he can do nothing. So he can't do anything apart from the Father. Now, actually read what Jesus says in context. Um, what happens earlier in the exact same chapter, there was a dispute among the rabbis, uh, on whether God works on the Sabbath, right? Human beings can't work on the Sabbath. But there was, a, there, was, there was a discussion among the rabbis, does God work on the Sabbath? Because God is upholding and sustaining the universe. So doesn't God work on the Sabbath? In John chapter 5, Jesus says, my father is working until now, and I myself am working, right? So what he's saying is, yes, you guys don't get to work on the Sabbath, but I do because God does, right? Now think about that, right? That is absolutely blasphemous if he's a mere human being. That is absolutely blasphemous if he is a mere human being. He's saying, yes, human beings, we don't get to work on the Sabbath, but God does, so I do too. Right? So they understood him to be claiming that he is another God, right? that, that God produced an offspring and he's claiming to be him. That's what he's accused of in John chapter 5. Now, is Jesus another God? Is he an offspring of God so that he is another God and can go and, can go and do what he wants? Is that, is that correct Christian theology? No, he's not. In other words, they misunderstood his, his claim. So what do you have right there in John? Well, he goes ahead and explains Christian theology to them. And what he, does, what he says is, yes, I'm the one who raises the dead at the resurrection. Yes, I'm the final judge of all mankind. Read the passage. He claims that he's the final judge. He decides who's going to heaven and hell. He's the one who raises the dead at the resurrection. So these are things that God does. He even says that... Uh, that uh, all judgment has been committed to him, the son, so that we honor the son the same way they honor the father. Now, what mere human being can say that we honor him just as we honor the father? The only way you would honor someone the same way you honor the father is if you shared the nature and attributes of the father. It's the only way it would happen. So Jesus is clearly claiming to be God. And yet he wants to make it clear that he's not claiming to be a separate God from the father. So... Of his own self, he can do nothing. He can't do anything separately from the Father. Now, guys, do we believe that Jesus does anything separately from the Father? No, no. Think about this. If the second person of the Trinity comes to earth, would he become a renegade? Mm -hmm. If the second person of the Trinity comes to earth, right, would he do anything else other than what this? God would do? Yeah. You know? So we can't have Jesus being a renegade deity, right? And as a man, he's going to continue communication with the Father. So that's why the Son... Is praying to the Father. So they've had divine communication for all eternity. And prayer is just simply the way that the incarnated Son of God continues that communication. But he wouldn't be a rebel. He's not going to be no. an atheist. And that's no. why, you know, sometimes people raise, they say, why does Jesus say my God and, and your God or something like that? Well, Jesus is not going to be an atheist. You know, he's he's also a first century Jewish man. No, 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 no. Just think about this, because this, this is important how, how Muslim apologists read the Bible, right? Jesus is claiming over and over and over again to be God in this passage. They go immediately to, of my own self, I can do nothing, which when you read in context, the whole passage can only be understood in light of the doctrine of the Trinity. They go to that one little part, block out everything else in the passage, and then, ha-ha, you see this agrees with Islam. No, it doesn't. 
You want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add, you know, a lot of people, when they say, if, if Jesus is God, to whom is he saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, we can go to Hebrews chapter 1, where God the Father says to the Son, your throne, O God, is forever. And also goes on to quote from Psalm 102, where uh, it says, you know, to whom, to which of the angels did God ever say, you, O Lord, laid the foundations of the earth. So here the Father is calling the Son, Lord. The Father is calling the Son, God. So again, you have further reinforcement of that divine trin trin Trinitarian relationality. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Now, um, we have a lot of questions here, but there's actually a question, a question I have that relates to, uh, uh, to all of us. All of us. Very important to us. Okay. And it's a question for our good friend, Mark Middleburg. Which is? How does he raise such awesome, nice kids, right? <laughs> yeah. See why this relates to us, guys? <laughs> you understand. <laughs> you understand why this relates to us. Yeah, Mark. because John and I are raising you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because we all have, we're all concerned about raising good kids. Now, I can, uh, I'm good at raising kids who can beat people up if necessary. <laughs> but, uh, but <laughs> I look at uh, at Mark and yeah. his wife and his kids, and I think, wow, this is a really, really nice, sweet <laughs> family. How did such a thing happen in this world? <laughs> so, you want to get a yeah? That's Mark. What do you say, Mark? And by by the by the way, uh, Mark, could you just uh, tell everyone yeah. who you are? Just so just so you know, guys, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, books here by. Mark Middleberg, um, they might know your partner better. Right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, Wait, well, hold it up there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you got to hold the bottom one. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh, right. There we go, yeah. Brand new devotional. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and explain, explain a little of, uh, uh, of your background and then get, in, get into the, the question about the kids. Well, first thing I got to say, I invited oh. David Wood to a party and a live webcast broke out. So <laughs> <laughs> you know how to party, don't it's you? That's how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no party like the live stream party. Uh, well, all right. So, where do you want me to start? My background? Yeah, yeah. Just tell everyone who you are, because yeah. you're 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 more in the background, right? Lee was Lee was in the in the spotlight after he, after the case for Christ came sure. out. But sure. those who actually follow apologetics, we know exactly who you are. But for yeah. for people who aren't necessarily following apologetics, they they've still heard of Lee Strobel, not not necessarily you. Yeah. What's what's up with that anyway? But anyway, yeah. <laughs> some, some, some people hog, some people hog the hog the like, you know. <laughs> That's true. So yeah, Lee Strobel and I have been ministry partners for thirty one years. Mm -hmm. uh, we started in ministry the same day in Chicago. Uh, we continue to write and speak and do simulcasts and. Uh, conferences and all kinds of stuff together. Um, we're all about sharing the gospel of Christ and the reasons to believe. So apologetics and evangelism. Hey, um, by, by the way, this uh, is awesome, guys. Uh, we, we know we can't even see most of the comments. They're coming so yeah. fast. But um, sure. uh, Omar Hussein here, watching from Somalia. Greetings, Omar. And uh, to everyone else, we I, I know you guys are watching uh, watching all over the place. Now, back to this. Uh, whoa, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you got to aim your camera. Man, I'm going to tilt it down. I'm going to tilt it down. All right. So now we have. Now we have. And I've. I just wanted to say I've always, always been impressed by this because uh, th those of you who, who who know my background, I came uh, out of prison, but uh, you know I, I became a Christian in jail. So for the first several years of being a Christian, um, all the other Christians I knew were like drug dealers or robbers or rapists. So everyone had a bad, messed up background. That was completely normal Christianity for me. All of these guys had horrible backgrounds. What impressed me was uh, when I got out and people would ask me to, to share my testimony and so on. And uh, I would share, you know, really wild story. Afterwards, someone would come up to me and say, yeah, you know, I don't really have a testimony because basically, I, you know, I was raised by really awesome Christian parents who, you know, they would pray with me before I left the house and uh, I've never gotten in trouble. I've just been serving God my whole life. So, yeah, I don't have your kind of story. And I'd be thinking, what? That's the real, that's the cool story. Right? That's the awesome story. Any idiot can fall down a hill, right? That's just gravity. So just any idiot can do all sorts of horrible, horrible things. Uh <laughs> Actually serving God your whole life, that's uh, that's some amazing stuff. So, how do you guys do it? Well, first of all, this is my wife, Heidi. Hi. And uh, she's probably the best to answer this question. But uh, we got married as followers of Christ, and we decided from the beginning we wanted to serve him. And, uh, and whenever we would have a family that we wanted to 
teach them and raise them in, in the faith and have done our best to do that. Um, I, I had to have Heidi here to talk about this because she, you know, we decided early on to teach them at home and uh, Heidi did the lion's share of the work on that. And that enabled us, you know, as a speaker and as a teacher, I, I've, uh, you know, I speak all around the world. And so we were able to take the family on ministry trips to Norway and Australia and Germany and, and all over the place. And Heidi was always so good to then turn those into educational trips. So that all of a sudden the kids are learning, you know, the geography and the, you know, about the history of the area and the languages and the, um, you know, what kind of animals <laughs> they have there. And, and she, she's turned everything into teaching. And always, both of us have tried to instill spiritual values to, to do what you said, David, mm -hmm. to pray with our family. We call it our family group. And uh, Matthew and Emma Jean, uh, from when they were little kids, we took them to church. We'd pray together. We'd uh, try to always encourage them and help them to do what's right. But I'm talking too much, so you talk, Ed. Well, what do you want me to say? <laughs> what do you want me to answer? Um, anything you'd like to add to that? Here. Anything you'd like oh. to add basically on uh, on uh, several of us here in this room and many people out there. Um, we have kids. We're good at having kids. I've had five of them. I'm a world champion at, uh, at having sons, five, five sons. But uh, after that, right, we, we have sort of generational issues, right? Like, like uh, uh, we, we, do, we used to do something in, in my church where you would uh, sort of map out all your family relationships and then you would sort of uh, map out any problems you have, right? Difficulties you have with re relationships with others. And then you start looking at your parents and grandparents and everything you know about their relationships. You can almost always see, oh, this is my problem with other people. You can look, oh, that was my grandpa's problem with other people. You can see they're, they're sort of generational mm -hmm. issues. And so um, when it comes to raising kids, I look back and massive dysfunction uh, breaking that, you know, how do you break that chain? Yeah. You didn't, you didn't, probably didn't have to deal with that. And so, I didn't. Uh, how do, how do we, uh, how we're looking for any tips at all yeah. on raising good kids? Yeah. Well, part of it is just being honest with your kids, always, you know, being forthright. And when you're, you're trying to live out your faith to be honest about, you know, times that are hard for you and, and we, we just include our kids in everything that we do. We, we, Mark mentioned the family group, and that's what we call it. And we, we're constantly texting each other, like, all through the week and telling each other prayer requests and different things like that. But <laughs> there's my kiddos. And, uh, hey, you've got yeah. the whole family here. Hey, there's my, <laughs> it's my daughter, Emma Jean, our daughter, Emma Jean, and our son, Matthew. <laughs> but, yeah, it's all the little things, you know, the little um, – things along the way where you just you make good choices with with what you're encouraging them to be involved with even the kind of friends that they choose um, we, we were always you know real careful to let them have friends that weren't believers but also encourage them to be with people who were believers so that they had good um, uh, you know I don't know good influences moments, yeah. yeah right but we also just try to have a lot of fun I mean we just we really did try to make it a joy along the journey so. And I think a big part of it is making sure they see that your faith is yeah. a real part of your everyday yeah. life. That it's not something you do on Sunday and turn on and turn off when you're around the church or around Christians. Yeah. But it's it's day in, day out. It's you know whatever we're thinking about, going through problems we're facing. You know that we can sit down like we did a couple nights ago yeah. and <laughs> had a family yeah. meeting yeah. and uh, talk through some things we're dealing with and prayed together mm -hmm. and. So I think helping them to see that your faith in Christ is integrated into every part of your life. Um, but, you know, we got the real, uh, the, the kids here. <laughs> uh, you guys can add or subtract. I, I, wanted, want to to, uh, I wanted to uh, <clears throat> address one quick ob objection right here. Uh, don't pretend you're perfect. <laughs> were, you guys, were, were you guys pretending to be perfect? You know what? Nope. I heard Heidi say the word dang once. <laughs> <laughs> I did? Yeah. I see she is. <laughs> sure. No, but David, when you talk about generational things, I mean, I, I really was blessed to have my my great grandfather come over here from Norway and he was a believer in my, you know, my mom. And my, so, 
it's great when you can have good Christian and values. My, and that, my parents met at Wheaton College. Yeah, so, so I mean, <laughs> those things help. But it, to encourage those of you who didn't have that situation, now's the time to break the baton. Hand out a different baton. Say, you know, this is not how we're going to live our lives as a family. And uh, I was just going to say, because it's Thanksgiving, I just want to mention one thing that our kids used to always do. We encourage them to play the giving game. And uh, do you guys remember this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they, they would uh, just give each other things all the time. I say, hey, why don't you guys play the giving game? And so they just give each other little gifts. And, and, uh, and to this day, it's just something that's in their hearts, like being, um, being givers instead of just takers. You know, in this time of the year when people are thinking about, oh, what am I going to get my kids for Christmas or whatever, think about what you can give away. And um, those are little little hints that help your kids be more thoughtful of others than always what they're going to be getting. Okay, so I play Call of Duty Black Ops with my kids, and you're saying <laughs> you're saying the giving game, the giving game would, would help too. Now, uh, let, 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 let's hear let's hear from the the the, uh, the kids real quick. Now, um, uh, Matthew, yes, um, I am pretty confident and willing to wager that uh, my two oldest boys, who are 15 and 13, could beat you up. I would absolutely, yeah, I would concede that. Yeah. All right, now, 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 why don't you two come up and uh, uh, tell us anything uh, <coughs> that helped that helped you guys? First, first, yeah. what do you, what, who, who are you guys? What do you guys do? Well, I'm Matthew, and um, I work with a ministry called Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, and so uh, wait, 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 wait. Yes. So if you raise an awesome kid, he could just go off to work with Ravi Zacharias <laughs> International Ministries. That's the deal, right there. You know, it's guaranteed. So <laughs> yeah, so I, I live up in Boston, and I work with different ministries up there, and speak on apologetics and things like that. So um, I think for me, just growing up with a family that really valued truth. And uh, with parents that really instilled that value in me, um, you know, just growing up, I was always concerned with what was the truth, what are, what, are, what, you know, not just what's nice or what's good, but what's true. And so uh, as I got older and I started to you know, look into apologetics and read some of my dad's books for the first time, I started to realize, wow, this thing is it's really true. It's not something I have to take blindly. It's not something I have to just believe because my parents taught me. Um, it's actually backed up by the evidence and it's something that I can um put my full faith and trust in. And so um, I think that was another great thing that my parents did. And I'm, I'm a dean. I'm older than him, even though he's <laughs> taller than me. I'm a year and a half older. Um, I work at Compassion International and a fantastic organization. Um, and just kind of going along with that, um, yeah, our parents just taught us truth all the time, taught us to really talk about what we're feeling and how we want to process things. Um, and just, I've, just had this strong love for Jesus my whole life and it's just because they've set this example for me and so every day you know I have that quiet time with the Lord and I see that love for Jesus in them too and so I'm glad that I have that example in them and so when I have a family I want to raise my kids the same way. Mm -hmm. And they grew up with a guy named Uncle Lee very close to the family who had an influence as well. Yeah. Lee Strobel. Uncle Lee? He's <laughs> not Lee. really an uncle, but that's what they grew up knowing him as. And, yeah. So having friends around your family, like you guys do with each other, uh, you know, John and uh, Vocab, and you, you, know, you can all influence each other's kids and families, and certainly Lee Strobel had that influence, and uh, some of the folks watching, um, uh, Brad Mitchell was, is one of my best friends, he's watching, and he, he had an influence, and uh, we're of course we're very close to uh, Nabil Qureshi, Nabil and Michelle, and uh, you know Nabil built into our kids, and Michelle mm -hmm. did. And so I think having friends and surrounding yourself with people who share those values really can make a difference as well. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a here's a quick question. Um, normally we take apologetics questions dealing with uh, Christianity and Islam and uh, sometimes atheism, but we're getting some practical questions here since uh, we're kind of addressing that topic. Um, anyone can jump in here. Um, sort of what do you do when you feel the pressure of being an example to others in church and your life is a mess? I know what that one feels like. I know what that one. So I, I mean, I don't know. I could probably, but uh, anyone want to? Wait, you guys don't even know what it's like to have your life. <laughs> I feel like I know what that's like. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to imagine. Life is a mess. Yeah, Why? How do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I would, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, we have this we have this natural tendency to not let other people know when when things are going on that's you know it's going to bring shame on us or something like that. 
Um, I found by experience, Christians are some, some, some understanding and forgiving people. And so, uh, I would say just be, be honest with people around you, especially your, your close friends. Don't try to pretend that, that nothing is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you can walk up to me, Davis, how your, how's your day? I said, man, it sucks. It's like horrible. It's awful. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend. So, uh, uh, yeah. And notice we don't look down on that, right? If, if you, if you're talking to someone, they say, man, this is a really hard time. I've got all these problems. Uh, I got problems with my, you know, my kids or my marriage or whatever it is. We don't say, oh, what a, what a bad, horrible person. You know, we, we, we try to help that, that person. So, uh, don't let pride, don't let pride, uh, uh, get in the way. All right. Who That's wants to, uh, you want to add something else? I'll add just on that. I think um, sometimes people have a a view of faith that um, sort of gets in the way of this. They have a, a view of kind of the way that we experience God that, you know, the more faith you have in God, the happier you'll be, the, the more satisfied you'll be. You'll uh, eventually reach a state of, uh, you know, no longer sinning anymore, or no longer having any weaknesses. And, uh, and that's just not true. I think if you look at the lives of um, great Christians. If you look at the life of even the Apostle Paul, how you know how constantly throughout his life he was having sorrows and troubles and um, things that he was dealing with, and how he, he talked about in Romans seven, how he still had these struggles with sin and things that were, were going wrong wrong in his life. Um, you know, it's 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 not something that you know. The more faith you put in God, immediately you'll be fixed and you'll never have uh, any problems anymore. Um, but God will walk with you through those things. He'll he'll be with you and. He'll um, be the support that, that guides you and gives you peace that surpasses all understanding throughout that. Uh, this is a question. What is, uh, what is Robbie like? What is Robbie like? Uh, he is one of the most gracious people. Um, he has no, uh, no desire to make his presence known in the room. He's no, no desire to, to let people know who he is or anything like that. He's um, the humblest, uh, one of the humble, most humble, uh, gracious people I've ever met. Mm-hmm. Uh, Emma Jean, I know how you feel. My youngest brother is way taller than me, too. Um, all right. Here's uh anyone can jump in with this. Hey, I am agnostic. I asked Jesus for a sign and I got a dream with a church in it. And a few days later, another. I had this dream where I was in a church seemingly reading the Bible. What does this mean? Um, any any dream interpreters here? <laughs> By the way, this is kind of a weird situation because, you know, uh, if you know Nabil's story, he started having uh, um, dreams um, that were telling him to leave Islam and become a Christian. And when he, he told me about his first one, I was thinking, it's a dream, dude, right? <laughs> you know, I don't care. Yeah. If, if I had a dream tomorrow, you know, telling me to convert to, to Buddhism, I would think, wow, what a... What a dumb dream. That, that's what I would think. But um, uh, it, it was actually Nabil's second dream. It was his second dream where he dreamt himself into a parable of the Bible that he had never read. Right? He had, he had never read that. Uh, it was a description of uh, the, the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. He, he, he dreamed that he was in that, and he had never read the passage before. And the description uh, that you read in the Bible is exactly what, it, uh, what his dream was. So... Um, I've never been to trusting of dreams because there can be too many influences, but uh, I would occasionally think they can be. Um, so what would we have to say for, because my inclination, if, 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 if we have an agnostic here, would be, don't necessarily trust your dream, but they're, they're, I can give you other things that you, that you should trust. So, so what do you want yeah, to tell I would me? just say, you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, sure. it talks about, get closer, get closer Mike. Yeah. Uh, it talks about, in, in 1 Thessalonians, it's easy to say. Thessalonians. You've written like a million books. And you yeah. can't say Thessalonians. <laughs> not, not, you know, this is a party. It's like late at night. We're having a party. But anyway, um, it says in that passage, uh, it says, don't despair like prophetic utterances. When things come at you that seem like maybe they're a word from God, and often that will be through someone saying, the Lord told me to say this, um, but in this case, maybe through a dream. It says, don't just automatically write those off, but test them, test all mm-hmm. things, and hold fast to that which is good. So I would test that, uh, and there's various ways you can do that. One is to uh, you know study the evidence for Christianity, to study what the Bible says about these things, uh, to to say kind of the skeptic's prayer, 
and say, you know, I'm not sure what I believe. I'm not sure there's even a God there. But if there is, I'm calling out to you. Kind of like Nabil prayed, mm -hmm. you know, with the real God, Joel himself. And I think if you pray that sincerely, if you, you tell the God of heaven, the God who uh, we're all convinced exists, you know, Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. Uh, if you knock, the door will be open. So I would say, test it, seek it, uh, keep an open mind. Go to the church that maybe was in your dream or find uh, one that, uh, you know, seems like a, a one that's really teaching the Bible and visit it and hang out there a little bit and, and say, God, is, is this real? What's up? And, mm -hmm. and study it. And so, and so think, oh, go ahead. I think the fact that you're tuning in right now could actually be the kind of sign you're looking for. Thanks for tuning in and, uh, and, and opening up your heart and your question. Uh, and you know, we're, you know, we're the, we, it, it's so wonderful. I mean, God is the one, as Mark was saying, who rewards those who earnestly seek him. And uh, the person who is an agnostic, I mean, there could be some who are militant agnostics who really aren't interested in the truth. And they say, you know, you know, I know that you can't know that God exists, but it sounds like there's a great sincerity here. And uh, and I think the great place to start is not just generically, but I think the place to start is, is with Jesus. When you look at, you know, if you want to know who God is, you want to look at the one who most clearly manifests who God is. The one who is making the, 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 these lofty claims, the one who uh, who vindicated those claims by rising from the dead. Uh, a lot of the world religious leaders, they like to claim Jesus as their own. They like to quote Jesus. Uh, so Jesus is a great place to start. Uh, I'll tell people when I'm talking with them about, a, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, well, this is what I think. And they'll give me their opinions about reincarnation, karma and so forth. And I'll say, well, if I had to trust you or Jesus, I'd go with Jesus every time. I mean, he has clout. He has spiritual authority that no other person has. What a great place to start. And so earnestly seek Jesus. Would encourage you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, again, uh, I wouldn't entirely trust uh, something like a dream, but there are basically two possibilities. There, there is a message there or there's not, right? If if it's not, then so what? You, 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 you had a weird dream, but... If it is, if that is something that 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 is should spur you on to to look uh, look a little more deeply, well, you uh, you you have that opportunity. And you said it a couple of times. Yeah. I would pay attention. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, Nabil, uh, uh, Nabil, when he had his first dream, um, he basically said he asked God for a for a vision, and he got a vision. And then he said, you know, a, a dream would be better. And uh, so then he had a dream. And then he said, well, three dreams would be better than one. And then, of course, he got all three. And he still didn't. He still didn't convert. He was still, uh, he was still wrestling with the issues. But uh, fortunately, fortunately, he, uh, uh, fortunately, he eventually made the right decision. Uh, and by the way, Ed Eduardo here. Eduardo says, I miss Brother Nabil. And uh, you're not the only one, Brother. Did, did, you knew Nabil, right? Did you know Nabil? Yeah. So, yeah, we, we, uh, we all, uh, we all knew We're at our house right now. And there's the guest room is right over here where Nabil used to stay whenever he was in town. So yeah, we're all missing Nabil. And I thankful I, for his influence. I heard Nabil messed up some steaks and almost like burn your kitchen down or something. <laughs> yes, <like that. laughs> yes, he did. He had this special. I thought I thought okay. Heidi was going to rush in and no, talk no, about no, the, the reason. The reason I find that uh, mm. that 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 shocking is Nabil. Um, Nabil was a steak connoisseur. Nabil made the best steak I've ever had in my entire life, pan searing and stuff like that. So we actually like burn. Burnt, messed up some steaks in your yeah, house? Yeah, they were so good, but he didn't know our oven. And, uh, oh, okay. So he had the special thing that he would broil them at a real high high temperature. And yeah, the th whole thing started on fire. So it was quite exciting. It's a good reminder that every, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've, uh, we're planning for uh, a... a um, just to go for an hour, so we got about we got about twelve more minutes. Um, I find we have kind of a couple different kinds of groups of people um, on my channel. Some people are are primarily interested in jihad and you know terrorism and what this has to do with the Islamic sources. Uh, some people are interested in, in apologetics dealing with Islam. Some people are more interested <clears throat> in uh, in in general apologetics, and uh, the issue often comes up. You know how, how do you how does someone get started right how do how do I get started um, in apologetics so uh, you guys have been doing this a lot longer than 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 the rest of us here even the other people in this room so because you're old and you've been doing this a long time no offense no offense no it's, hey hey this gray hair is a 
It's a fun badge of honor. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you got what would you what would you guys share? Because I'm saying this because I get asked this almost every day. Hey, you know, because people become Christians. Sometimes it's because they uh, they saw some apologetics and they become you know they become Christians and they want to carry that on, but really don't have any idea of, of how to get started or where to where to go. So, well, um, I'll just jump in first and say that when I came to Christ at age 19, um, I had drifted away from what my parents taught me, and I'd been kind of a low-key prodigal son all through high school and when I at age 19 I finally came back I just knew right away I had to share this with people and this the gospel is too good of good news to not tell other people about it and so I immediately started to talk to people at the store I worked at and shared with various people and and saw God use that I saw a number of people come to faith but I also ran into all kinds of cults and world religions and isms and you know belief systems that I didn't know anything about. And so I kind of got into apologetics by trying to figure out how to answer people's questions that I was talking to. Uh, I remember one time I was in a shopping mall and, uh, in my hometown way up in North Dakota where I grew up. And I'm in the shopping mall and this girl's playing a guitar and I get talking with her and, and find out she's a religious person. She's something I'd never heard of. She's a Baha'i. And I said, what's a Baha'i? And she said, well, we follow Baha'u'llah. And I'm going, oh, thanks a lot. That's, that really makes it clear. Uh, I said, who's Baha'u'llah? You know, what are you talking about? And uh, she started explaining it to me. And then I went and did some research and study. And in the process became, you know, fairly proficient in my understanding of that world religion. And that, I could just tell that kind of story over and over. That's what got me into it. And I, I would add one more for me is when I got to college and had a professor who really challenged what he considered the simplistic belief and trust in the Bible and in what he called the traditional views of God uh, that included what I believed. And so there again, my faith was challenged. So I had to do extra research and extra study, read a bunch of books, I found some mentors, Bob and Gretchen Passantino on the West Coast, who I would talk to on the phone for hours on end. And it was in, in the process of answering my own questions and trying to help the people I was talking to, I gradually became fairly well-versed in you know Christian apologetics. And then finally then went on to study more in a professional environment, went to Trinity Seminary, where I met this guy, and Paul and I met uh, back in the 80s. Uh, Place. We are old, aren't we? But uh, that's where we met and began studying together. So that's kind of my story. I'll let Paul speak to it. Well, as you engage in apologetics, I think you want to do it well. You want to uh, learn the material. I think if you want to go to a one-stop shopping on apologetics, I would recommend William Lane Craig's website, uh, reasonablefaith.org, which has video debates that you can watch and learn from, uh, articles, the question of the week and so forth. You know, Bill Craig was a professor of ours at the Seminary, seminary. Yeah. and uh, we've teamed up with him on various projects and uh, and he's one who has done it well and there he has a kind of, in a sense, the machinery uh, to help train you in apologetics. There are reasonable faith uh, groups that are perhaps in your area become a part of that uh, where you have speakers coming in once a month and you learn from them you know again become involved maybe in the evangelical philosophical society we have apologetics conferences around the country we just finished up a conference today here in Denver uh, it comes once a year in November uh, and so so just stay tuned for that some people will travel uh, across states to come to uh, to that it's a great place to be encouraged to meet other people who are doing the, doing the same sort of thing you may feel like you're alone in your church feeling like you're a weirdo but then you come to these conferences you say wow there are a lot of people like me who get into this and so would encourage other you weirdos. other weirdos other weirdos <laughs> and uh you know but but i think we've all seen that how important it is to uh to to engage in apologetics in in a world in which is we feel like there's greater fragmentation and the gospel speaks in the marketplace of ideas and we ought to be able to eloquently defend the gospel with gentleness and respect um this is another practical question here. Um, when we sin, how do we know when we have restored fellowship with the Lord? Um, once saved, always saved, but how do we know when fellowship is restored after sin? Any, any thoughts on that? I, I look to the verse, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, and of course it's implying if we sincerely 
you know, admit what we've done and, and repent of it. We're turning away. We're, we're confessing it to God. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And I think the danger we have is we fall into a, a mentality where I have to pay penance somehow. I have to work it off. I have to, you know, somehow earn his good favor again. And the message in that first, the message in Scripture, you go to the book of Galatians, uh, Romans, many other places, is you can't earn anything. So don't wallow in it. Don't stay in it. Just come and bring it to God. Lay it at the foot of the cross, as they say, admit your sins. And he will forgive you and restore fellowship right then, right there. And I think it's also important that we counter the, the voice of Satan, who is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, and I think it's a, a wonderful example to look at Martin Luther, who, when he felt accused in his heart, uh, he, you know, and, and Satan would tell him, Martin, you're a lecturer, you're, you're greedy, and so forth. And, and Martin would say, you know, I agree with you. In fact, I could give you a whole lot of other things that you could add to your list. In fact, there are things that I don't even know about. Uh, that no, oh, hang on, went right back on. Oh no, no. you guys, are, you guys are good. You guys are good. <laughs> guys, uh, sorry about that. That's actually a computer prog uh, problem where uh, things are, have been randomly shutting down on my computer. If anyone ever wants to chip in for a, a computer that works better, I will. <laughs> I will gladly receive it. All right. Uh, any uh, closing thoughts for uh, for everyone? Um. What's the last thing? Oh, I was oh, okay. asking about NDEs. Oh, did you want to finish well, your response? Finish. Yeah, <laughs> as I was saying, uh, before technology uh, gave way, um, you know, Martin Luther reminded Satan that uh, he could add so much more to that accusation. But because Jesus Christ is his faithful Savior, that, uh, that all of these accusations, you know, they fall to the ground because it is Christ's sufficiency and not my own. That, w that wins me not only status before God, but also it enables me to maintain that fellowship with God. That if I you know, re acknowledge who I am before God, acknowledge my own sin, that God, uh, as Mark was saying, uh, promises to forgive, to cleanse. And even those things that we don't even recognize, that, he, that the sins that we confess, he will forgive, and he'll also he cleanse us from all unrighteousness, those things that we don't even know, those things that don't even come to mind. Uh, so God is greater than our hearts. Let's trust in who Jesus is rather than maybe in a feeling that we have. Uh, First John reminds us also that God is greater than our hearts. He knows all things. And if we put our trust in Jesus Christ, confess our sins, let us move forward with confidence that Christ will fulfill his promise to forgive us and enable us to, to carry on our relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank, you for, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're about out of time here. I did want to uh, address one more thing just because uh, it got brought up over and over again. Hey, David, is Islam facing a decline in the future? Um, as, uh, as almost all of you know, Islam is primarily growing due to birth rates, due to high uh, birth rates. Um, whether you talk about Europe or the Middle East or um, other areas of the world, um, Muslim birth rates are the, are, are the highest of, of any group. And so that is the main reason for the spread of Islam. So the question is, the, the question is, uh, is that going to be counteracted by the number of Muslims who are leaving Islam? And yes, it is a, it, it is a fact that uh, the number of people who are leaving Islam is accelerating very rapidly. There are places uh, in the Muslim world where the young generation of Muslims are starting to uh, despise and reject the religion, even though they can't always say so vocally. Uh, tons of research that in places like Iraq, the young generation uh, very frequently do not like Islam anymore because they've seen the impact. And so uh, how's all this going to come together? Well, um, well, we'll have to wait and see. Um, don't know exact because you do have the high birth rates, uh, but you have some other factors. And so uh, we'll see over the next few years on, uh, on whether uh, this is going to lead to some sort of significant decline. Um, all right. Uh, you guys want to say anything before we close out? No, good to see you guys. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Oh, did, did you get, did you know that we're kind of wearing a, they're slightly different. These guys. We were, Vocab was buying a, a Black Panther shirt, and uh, I, I jokingly said, hey, I should get one, and then we'll kind of be matching. And I was not serious at all, but he thought that was the, the coolest idea anyone had ever come up with. And so, uh, yeah, we're kind of uh, we're kind of matching. So, 
Anyway, yeah, I kind of look like I'm matching though. Yeah, you, you, yeah, kind of do. Yeah, that's a he, that's a ministry just, shirt though. He just left out the panther part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got, got the a black part right though. Yo, ten thousand subscribers. What happens on my channel? We're taking a vote. Do you want us to do a roast me session? You want us to do a 25 minute freestyle concert, or do you want us to take Islamicize me in a different name to Facebook? So far, so the third option is winning, but do yeah, you think I should sure. do them all three? Did you I, I like the I like the first one. <laughs> <laughs> did you say you would freestyle for 25 minutes? <laughs> no, no I'd have a party. I'd invite some other rappers on. And we don't oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, How I about can... all three of us freestyle for 25 minutes? I'm with that if you guys would do that. <laughs> I can't freestyle. I'm, guys, I'm, gonna try. I'm like uh, 400 away from 10K. <laughs> you're going to be... You're gonna be... Yeah, he's going to be the dude that's going to write it and act like he's freestyling. Oh, yeah. My, yeah, my freestyle would not be pretty. My name is David, and I'm on the mic. And that's as far as I would get. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be able to finish. Yeah, I'm big and white. <laughs> that's Yo. all right. Uh, all right, thanks, everyone, for uh, for tuning in. And uh, glad that uh, uh, Mark allowed us to uh, to jump online here while, while we're at his house. And we're going to get back to this uh, apologetics party. So we'll see you all next time. See you guys. Peace.